And hopefully everyone should see me. Okay. Okay. So chapter 17, cardiovascular emergencies. These are your objectives and standards uh, where you can find the key terms for this presentation. Well, hopefully you've read it before we're, we're actually diving into it. So we're gonna look at the cardiovascular system again and the pathophysiology associated with it. We'll run through that once more at um, national fields. That's extremely important. And then cardiac compromise and acute coronary syndrome. Uh, those are gonna be a lot of your cases, uh, again, along with breathing. And then nitroglycerin use, age-related variations of both pediatric and geriatrics, and how to assess. So your assessment and general care um, uh, based on national standards and other places, you may uh, end up with a little bit more to do, and I'll kind of go through that. But here's a case study. I, I kind of, this one's actually a pretty good one. And it, you got two EMTs, Ellen and Lisa, caring for a 62-year-old man. This guy has a history of angina. Um, I know you probably, unless you've read the chapter, really don't know too much about angina. But uh, Mr. Fry's got an onset of heavy pressure, center of the chest, ready to do the shoulder. And I'm highlighting the stuff that this is very typical. Um, profuse sweating. So one of the EMTs, Ella, has a general impression is, this guy's alert, he's really anxious, pale and diaphoretic, and his expressions appear, indicate he's in a lot of distress. So um, angina typically is not that bad. Um, to they, I haven't had any diaphoretic yet in all of the 40 years I've been practicing paramedic and as a nurse, but I can tell you if somebody's having a heart attack, um, this fits the profile, but right now we don't know. We're going to need more information. We're going to get a little bit more understanding. So we want to explore the following. The, the process that leads to angina, the uh, presentation between angina or something else like myocardial infarction, and what are things you might want to assess when you come, you come in contact with somebody like that. So just remember, heart disease is, in America, still the number one killer. It still... Um, supersedes cancer. It's also, again, heart disease leads to chest discomfort and cardiac arrest, whether it's chest discomfort angina or chest discomfort myocardial infarction, and we'll, we'll split those two and get more in, in involved in understanding both of those. And you know, what are the consequences of somebody that's having an MI or having an angina attack? So we, when somebody's having a um, chest pain, and they're they're like the description of Mr. Frey, uh, we call it cardiac compromise, and the person has a cardiac emergency. Um, we already know that the three major components associated with the circulatory, the heart, blood vessels, and blood, all of them are going to be, you know, related. And we're going to come back to and, and kind of a look at their different angles of those three. Um, the conduction system, super important to understand it, that the conduction system, much like a wiring in your house, you know, you turn on a switch, lights go on, life is good. Um, anything happens to that conduction, then it's not going to reach the light bulbs or lights. And so you have a malfunction. Much Kind of the same way with your heart, but what's nice about the heart, it has a redundant system. That'd be nice if houses did. Um, interesting. That's a somebody's a contractor, you might want to think about that. So pacemaker sites. So your ma major, there are three major pacemaker sites you have to know. And that's sinal atrial node in the atria. It's sitting up in the top of the atria of the right atria. Atrioventricular node which sets between the atria and the ventricles, and the Purkinje fibers. The best one being sinal atrial node, your back subsystems, the atrioventricular node, and your super last resort is your Purkinje fibers. 
and you really don't want those to be firing. Um, you don't do very well that way. Okay, again, a reminder of the cardio of the cardiac electrical system. The sinoatrial node is your major pacer pacemaker of the heart. Okay, and it generates the you know the impulses. For example, right now I'm at about 70, 70, between 72 and 74, and I'm drinking coffee. Uh, that's what picked up my heart rate. So whatever you're sitting there at and you got a pulse rate at, that is your inherent rate sitting there to meet your needs. Unless you're drinking a monster, unless you're drinking coffee like me. So it got my heart rate up there a little bit. So uh, again, it comes from the SA node. There's several different influences um, on your rate uh, that your body will used to uh, help keep you in homeostasis if you're in a crisis, meaning a gunshot wound or car compromise or um, hypotension or hypoperfusion state. So your body will increase the heart rate. So they're, you're interlinked with the brainstem and with your endocrine system to for survivability, and your heart will play a major role in that too by receiving those sign signals and to pick up the pace if they need to. Okay, now remember, we always say if somebody's in cardiac arrest, they have four to six minutes. The, begin, the brain will begin to die. So kind of use that as a general guideline in case you have a question. So if somebody um, has been in cardiac arrest for, um, um five minutes let's say then the brain's going to begin to die so that's kind of that's in that four to six minute so be watching for questions like that on the national registry so it may go like immediately following onset of cardiac arrest the brain cells would get been to die after four to six minutes well they're going to give you either four five or six okay as a choice um Again, the rarities are a little more rare is that there are a lot of people that if their body temperature is cool, they're you can throw that out. You know, they're going to last much longer. And I've had quite a few patients like that. So, uh, you know, nobody's dead until they're warm and dead. <clears throat> okay, so the next one is the AV node. And you can see that it's blind there. And that piece of tissue there is your backup system. So if you lose your sinus, sinal atrial node, the AV node will back up. So your sinal atrial node, the inherent rate, which you should remember, in case you hear it again or see it again on any type of test, everyone's using 60 to 80 now as a normal sinal atrial node pace, pacing. And it's automatic. It just does it. Okay? Um, as long as there's no um, weird anomalies. The atrioventricular, though, it's beating. So if the SA node stops, its beating rate is any, you know, anywhere from 40 to 50, that general area. I go by what your book says. And again, I got I haven't unpacked them yet, but I have quite a few cardiology books. And they give a little bit different uh, picture of that. But use use what's in your book, 40 to 50 is about is, is good. And then if for some reason, poof. You lose your AV node and you lose your SA node because they have some uh, common blood flow uh, vessels that feed both of those. If for some reason they have a myocardial infarction just above that, where it splits and feeds the SA node and splits and feeds the AV node, and if that's blocked off, the only thing you have left, which on a different system, is your Purkinje fibers. And your Purkinje fibers will fire about 15 to 20 per minute. Again, use your books, uh, what your book is saying. So we know that the heart uses what's known as automaticity. And again, it's influenced by the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. You're going to hear it again because I want you to remember it if you have it on a test. Is that your sympathetic system speeds it up. Your parasympathetic slows it down. Your sympathetic 
Your sympathetic system is your gas pedal. Your parasympathetic is your brake. Unless you hit a big ice chunk and tear out your rear brake lines on my nice big white truck, old white truck. Okay, the the heart um, has to be able to pump and strong enough to pump throughout the body. We know that, and the left ventricle overcomes the pressure as as it pushes out all the all out through the aorta, through all the arteries, arterioles the capillaries, it has to be able to pump hard enough and push hard enough. Now, the pressure that it's overcoming is called <clears throat> afterload, and it has to do with how big or close your, your uh, vessels are, meaning your arteries. So people with heart failure, uh, meaning that their arteries can't open and close really good, they're kind of stiff, they don't like to open too much, they stay at a, a specific opening uh, diameter and inside there's a lot of plaque so the more plaque the harder it has to push through um, and then the heart ends up in failure and, and all kinds of stuff so and I'll get a little bit more into this heart failure issue but the result of heart failure is your pulmonary edema okay and I'm not going to go through the heart my again my suggestion is you know which valves go all for Pardon me. No all four valves. The two most common they ask about when students come back to me say, hey, I had this question or that question, which I ask people to do, is the tricuspid valve between the right atrium and right ventricle and the bicuspid valve, which we also affectionately call it the mitral valve, which is between the left atrium and the left ventricle. So those are two, and the reason they they kind of um, kind of um, use those two versus the other two is because there's some issues that can happen to those. Um, on the uh, mitral valve, ten percent of females will develop mitral valve prolapse. That's only ten percent, and um, and the tri and the tricuspid valve. Can also get calcification, and if they're an IV drug shooter, that's where we usually find the stuff. It looks like I tell you, it looks like lettuce growing on there, like um, um, romaine lettuce or butter lettuce. Um, but yeah, it's pretty. It's just the strangest thing you've ever seen. Okay, so there there's a problem with those two. So um, now, just again, just briefly look at this. Like wow. Look how um, this is a complete circuit. It's the cardiorespiratory system. Think of any little thing that can cause a problem. Let's look at that, the right lung. We just recently dis discussed pulmonary emboli. So you get a clot in that right you know, vasculature of the lung that's going to interfere with ventilation. Look at the left ventricle. You get a myocardial infarction inside that, that ventri ventricular tissue. And this is another National Registry test. They want you to know if you have a heart attack on your left ventricle, you know, where is the blood going to back up? Well, kind of think about it. Okay, if you, if your right side, if the right side, the blue side, which is your low pressure, pumps 100 cc's, uh, we'll just say 100 cc's is, uh, that's an awful lot. Let's say uh, 20 cc's every squirt, every pump, and then your left ventricle in a normal is 20 cc's. So now we got what goes in and comes out, right? We got the circuit. But if somebody has a myocardial infarction or a heart attack on the left side, the red side, in that large ventricular tissue, and now it can only pump out uh, 15 cc's, and the right side, the blue side, low pressure is still only pump is still pumping its nice 20 cc's. You're going to have a deficit, okay? And if you look um, at the little arrows in the left ventricle, the red side, and the little ventricle, it's they're coming back from the lungs. So what's going to happen is 
you're going to have blood keep getting pumped to the lungs, but it can't come out of the lungs efficiently into the uh, left ventricle because it's only pumping out 15 cc's and the other side's pumping 20. So the deficit's going to be in the lungs. So that's a concept you need to remember if you want to get that question right on the national cut, which is a bread and butter question for them. Uh, a lot of people tell me they want you to know about heart failure. Okay. And then vice versa. If they have fa failure on the right side and it, it pumps less than the left side, then everything below in the, in the below that area is where it's going to, you're going to see a lot of um, buildup. So people with right heart, right side heart failure have huge legs ankles, uh, shins that are swollen and full of fluid. And we'll see a lady like that here in a little bit. And a lot of times, if you have right-sided, you're going to end up with left-sided. If you have left-sided, you're going to end up with right-sided. It's just the way it works. Okay. And we already know our circulatory system, arterioles, arter arteries, arterioles, to capillaries, to venules, to vein. Back again. And you've probably seen this plenty of times. And this one plenty of times. Remember, you have far more volume in the veins than you do the arteries. Okay, so that's, the heart muscle is perfused by what we call coronary arteries. And each of the coronary arteries has its own name, so to speak, or description. So we occlusion of any coronary artery, it was going to deprive the heart of oxygen. We call it a heart attack. And if it deprives it of nutrients and oxygen, you end up with a heart attack. You can end up in heart failure, meaning immediate heart failure, if it's on the left ventricle. Okay. If it's the right side, you're not going to see it uh, for for you know hours and hours because it takes a while for your uh, backup to happen in the lower extremities, and you get the big puppy legs. And then abnormal cardiac rhythms can occur with a myocardial infarction. It's very common. Now, you're lucky you just only need to know a couple of vessels. Now, you need to know the left coronary artery. It branches off the aorta. And then the branch that comes off the left coronary ar artery on the very front, or what we call the anterior portion of the heart, is the left anterior descending, LAD. Um, we have and have had a name for it for, you know, ever since I've been um, a paramedic, we call it the widow maker. And the reason is, if you have a clot just right where that little black dot is and it comes down to it says anterior descending, if you have a clot there, everything from below that is not going to get any oxygen or blood flow. And if it doesn't get any oxygen or blood flow, that um, going down there, all that's going to die. And that is that particular area that that vessel services from there down is your left ventricle wall. The other vessel you need to know is the right coronary artery, and the right coronary branches out and down, and you have a chunk that goes to the bottom, called the inferior part of the left of the right coronary artery. So, a clot in any of that that artery um, has a funny little thing that it does has the heart do when you have a clot there. You usually see those people bradycardic, uh, meaning a slow heart rate. We already know red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and serum, you know, make up your circulatory, your blood of the circulatory system. But however, this is important that platelets play a real big role in cardiac emergencies. And that role has to do with clotting. So what we have is Platelets to thrombin and to fibrin, and all those are components of a clot. Platelets, thrombin, and fibrin. So a thrombus may be a form at the side of where plaque ruptures in the coronary artery. So what happens is you have plaque in your vessels, it ruptures. The body goes, oh, no, you know, you have a cut. We have to clot that clot. No different. Clot that cut. Anyway, so no difference. You get a cut here. You, know, you start bleeding, you put something on it. After a while, you know, 60, minutes, 60 seconds go by, you take off, it's nice and clotted. Okay, that's no different. The problem is it's happening on the inside of a vessel. And more specifically, it's happening on the inside of a coronary vessel, one of the heart vessels. 
So that in turn, you're messing with the major pump will be a little bit different if a clot happened in your foot. But if it happens in your heart, your big pump, that's a bad day. This is a really good, good uh, slide to ponder. It should be in your book. And what they, they have progressing here is that atherosclerotic plaque. So the plaque, what happens is eventually it has a little rupture. So if you go down to the bottom to C, somebody with angina would have C, meaning that one right there, uh, they'd be on his bike riding all of a sudden, start getting a little bit of chest discomfort and I feel all that great. Oh, I got angina, so to go take my nitro, blah, blah, blah. The one on the D with the red in the center, a piece of a piece of the plaque broke off that white the yellowish stuff broke off sent the signal to the body eh we need to clot we have an injury so that's why you get that blood clot forming there so all myocardial infarction is is a blood clot and it's usually due to a rupture of plaque uh, inside the coronary vessel. So we know the electric the the way, and you should remember the way the electrical impulse goes from the SA to the you know, travels through the atria, uh, and then once you have that happening, you have a contraction, then to the through the AV node down to the ventricles, splits into a left and right ventricle, and then you have a ventricular contraction. Now, if you don't have this happening. Um, then you have some cardiac compromise. I want you to remember that EKGs are just a graphic representation of the heart activity. I have a patient that have had uh, initial EKGs that were perfect, rate of 70, PQ, OPQRST, I mean, yeah. So uh, they're uh, complete. Um, EKG was showing, you know, beats at 70, look perfect, but I had no pulse. Well, the reason that the young gentleman didn't have any pulse, he just got drinking a bunch of RAID, industrial strength RAID, which is an organophosphate. And anyway, he ended up making it 60 milligrams of atropine later, but he did make it. So electrical activity is depolarization and repolarization. So when it comes to the heart and a contraction, you have to have depolarization happens first, and then repolarization happens after that to reset the heart for another beat. So the electrical activity, um, we detect that by electrodes. You hopefully have worked with those. If not, you'll be able to work with them. But in the hospital or in the field, they'll show you how to put on um, electrical pads, EKG pads, um, so you can monitor that person's electrical activity. So this is what a normal EKG tracing, I would know it. Uh, if you get one on the National Registry, they'll give you something like this, an EKG, and ask you what that first little bump is in front of the QRS complex. So any first bump prior to the QRS complex is called a P wave. The QRS complex and, excuse me, the P wave signifies atrial contraction. So this wouldn't be a bad thing to put on a, a card. This type of tracing and, you know, know that you know, what the P is and the QRS complex. So the P wave is the contraction or depolarization of the atria. The QRS complex is the, is the, the uh, depolarization of the ventricles. And it's also supposed to signify the contraction as well. So that means both ventricles are pushing out their blood. So T waves represent everything, you know, getting back to normal, meaning um, resetting itself and ready for another contraction when it needs to be. Now, these can be speeded up if you need to have them, or it can be slowed down if there are too many of them too fast. Okay, so again, your electrocardiogram, just a reminder of hypoxia or damage to the electrical system. 
is going to affect your pumping of your heart. They're not going to function right. So you can have uncoordinated firings of the ventricle impulses. One you should know is PVC. It stands for premature ventricular contraction. Also with this, you can pick up ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. But usually that person has now had them there's a cardiac arrest if you're doing CPR. You've already seen this slide before. You should know this about systolic, diastolic, and remember um, your um, what's called the distance between the two, your pulse pressure. You should know. Uh, super important in adequate circulation. So what happens if you have inadequate circulation, you're going to have hypotension or shock. The cells are going to be deprived of oxygen, nutrients, and waste removal. And again, this is in relevance to our heart. If you have hypovolemia and haven't plugged the dike for that person yet, um, they can potentially have um, hypoxia of the cells of the heart, and you can end up dying by going to VTAC or VFib. Heart failure, you can also have heart failure or vasodilation, which um, vasodilation may be um, warranted when it comes to um, angina. So the biggest take home is the time is critical. You pay a, uh, play an extremely important role in people's um, survivability uh, from a heart attack by getting them to a STEMI center, which is a special aid center for cardiac patients. Um, collectively, the condition, again, I refer to you as a cardiac compromise. Sooner any patient receives treatment, especially in our field, the better outcome they're gonna have. So here as you go, arterial sclerosis, and atherosclerosis. So your atherosclerosis is inflammation disease that affects your arteries. And then you have the inflammation process, which leads to a thrombus and an occlusion. So coronary uh, atherosclerosis, or CAD, is coronary artery disease. So we have vessels that have atherosclerosis, then they're going to have, have coronary disease. So we use the term acute coronary syndrome. Again, acute coronary syndrome is um, includes angina and myocardial infarction. It has to do with it. narrowed arteries leading to myocardial anemia. And then, again, it's a typical response to myocardial ischemia and chest pain. Very common. So if they are having an attack, they still have to go in, meaning you know that it's uh, something they've had before. Uh, we always want to look and see if it's a little different. <clears throat> so let's look at angina. And this is where we go back to that, looking at the inside diameter of those vessels. If they've gotten really small, the person's doing some kind of exercise, you know, on his exercise bike or whatever the case may be. Angina it then is... Um, will pop its head because the inner diameters of the coronary arteries cannot receive enough blood to meet the demands of the heart. So this results in chest discomfort or chest pain. Again, um, physical and emotional stress, mm, it can happen. Uh, and then generally relieved by rest and nitroglycerin. So if it's angina pectoris, it's where they're, again, deprived of oxygen, and you come along in a system with nitroglycerin, um, it opens up those vessels so they get more oxygen and the rest of the body. So you actually, in, in that circumstance, um, can relieve their chest pain with nitroglycerin. So 
This just shows the buildup. I like the little one at the top. It has now either an occlusion or it's so narrowed um, they're having a uh, ischemic event. An ischemic event of the heart is very, very, very painful. So angina pectoris is can be prolonged and worsen with exertion. It's called unstable. And angina pectoris you know, affects women, diabetics, elderly, may not have a typical presentation. The, they're, they're an underserved part of the population, meaning that women with cardiovascular disease versus men, I don't, they don't get picked up as, as often as what they used to. We've started now um, uh, making sure that we <clears throat> um, really assess women, diabetics and elderly above and beyond because their complaints can be so weird. Um, so a lot of times it shortens the breath or weakness, almost to the point of fainting for women, and a lot of lightheadedness. So how are we gonna manage this person with angina? angina? Manage the airway, give them supplemental oxygen or if they need it, it's under 40, 94%. They may have to assist them with their the systolic blood pressure, so it has to be above 90. That's your break off. It has to be above 90. And they should take 160, 324 milligrams. I don't know, that's just 25, but it's actually 24. So anyway, um, yeah, you want to, to make sure you got that right. Okay, so acute myocardial infarction. Um, this one, the plaque ruptures, clots form. Um, 20 to 30 minutes of inadequate perfusion, the heart muscle begins at night. So we really, really need to get on top of these when we come in through dispatch. Ischemia may lead to dysrhythmias and sudden death. Yeah, that's very true. So what can happen is if you're sitting there in VTAC all of a sudden, and I'm giving a speech, then, um, um, where was I going with that? Oh, okay, so you, you have uh, a ruptured plaque, you have the myocardial infarction, um, you have the inadequate perfusion, uh, the muscle will die. So this this event, chain of events has kind of a time important time frame. You can get people into the hospital under an hour and then what they call door to balloon time um, within an hour, then that person has the highest chance of survivability. Um, with having, you know, a heart attack. So treatments are to really restore perfusion. Um, they're time dependent. Usually they don't go much past about four hours, four or five hours. Um, here's a special class of people you might want to know because I know they're going to be asking something about silent MIs or um, unusual presentations with MIs. So diabetics and the elderly and women may complain of shortness of breath, nausea, lightheadedness, and or weakness as their presentation to cardiac arrest. It's a preview or preload to it. Anyway, so here's a way to distinguish angina from myocardial infarction. Once you kind of got this down in your memory, you're not going to uh, forget it. Okay. So... And giant pectoris and MI both have the same area they cover. Maybe the coronary arteries. And the signs and symptoms are a little bit different. Typically, you can get angina pectoris to subside. You're not getting myocardial infarction to subside. So if they've had good in-date in um, nitroglycerin and if they're low on oxygen, some supplemental oxygen, um, we'll bring them around. So it's not bad to give nitroglycerin to somebody with a myocardial infarction. Um, what we have to worry about is medics is trying not to give it to somebody that's had what they call an inferior oil MI. Up. 
And the reason for that is, is that's your preload. If you have nitro, that affects your preload by dropping it worse. So again, that's your blood pressure. So you should always, always, anyone with chest pain, shortness of breath, have one or other or both, should always have an AED at their side. That means you need to carry it in. Uh, airway management equipment, including oxygen bag administration. So next is nitroglycerin. And it's usually grain one one fiftieth, um, usually one tab lit under the tongue, and um, let it burn, and recheck their vital signs. Make sure they're not on any of the erectile enhancing drugs. Make sure that their blood pressure is above ninety. Uh, make sure they get aspirin one hundred sixty three hundred twenty five milligrams, um, chewable, not the enteric coated ones. Make sure you rendezvous with ALS. Back to Mr. Fry. So she got a, you know, on a focus exam, baseline vital signs. His discomfort 20 minutes ago came 20 minutes ago while he was riding a stationary bike, but it was not re relieved with the taking nitroglycerin. He's got a seven, and it's the worst that he normally has with his angina. So this guy might have finally included. Okay, um, worse normally has, um, okay, so he's giving you the kind of the scenario that this is probably more at myocardial infarction. That would be what I would bet. Here's this guy's vital signs. Pulse doesn't look bad. Blood pressure looks pretty good. Respirations look good, and his SpO2 is 99. So, Immediately, you should look at that and go, ah, it's SpO2 99. Yeah, I'm going to withhold oxygen for now. So what treatment should be implemented for the patient is assisting with his medicines like nitro but um, because his blood pressure is good enough. But I wouldn't be messing around with, uh, um, you know, too, uh, oxygen at this point in time because he's up there at 99. So and a triple A is a, a, aortic uh, aneurysm, Abdo usually abdominal aortic aneurysm, because they have they're more commonly, but they're not as quite as common as the chest ones. Um, I'm trying to think of who it was who had they had an operation not too long ago, and they came up to me and said, "Yeah, I had, you know, what's you know, the such and such replaced." Anyway, he had an aortic graft. He had an aneurysm um, in his abdomen area, and they went in and repaired it. Get out of it, fine. So what they are is just a weakened part of the aortic wall, and, and they, if they rupture, it's going to be fatal. So it looks like. So we call it a dissection, you know, tearing, uh, and layers of the of the. Um, um, vessel and one thing about this pain it's a 10 out of 10 right off the get-go severe next it's sharp tearing in nature often experience the back flank also or into the arms so it looks like it's the blood flowing past it now they have a big chunk that's dissecting or breaking off So in AAAs, don't give them aspirin. Uh, if you suspect it, better to be cautious. Um, and because two aspirin will reduce your clotting time by 25% for two days. So you might need that 25% if you have to go to surgery or in a car crash. Hopefully that makes sense. So... ACS occurs in males twice as much uh, than in females. So your classic signs for a, a white male or any male, actually I shouldn't say white male, any male. Um, dull substernal chest pain or discomfort, respiratory distress, nausea, di uh, diaphoresis, really profusely sweating. You, I just was amazed at watching people having an MI and watching it just sweat beat up. Now, in females, you have non-classical findings. They have a neck ache. 
And I would go along with this neck ache. It's usually weakness. Or maybe they broke out into a sweat. So you'd have to get that history. Pressure in the chest. Pains in the back, breast, upper abdomen. Tingling in the fingers. Never had one of those that was an MI. I've had them if they were hyperventilation syndrome, but not a, as an MI. But who knows? Unexplained fatigue or weight gain and insomnia. So again, why are they keeping you from oxygen on this patient? We just discussed is that he has too much. He has a 99 for an SpO2, so he has plenty of oxygen. If you put oxygen on him, you're going to kill him. You know, he's not going to get the. Uh, um, um, He'll get too much oxygen, which in turn release free radical produ pr production. And these free radicals just um, make it, um, you know, you're, so your mortality rate skyrockets. And that's something we just learned. This is new to the book, um, to this edition, the 11th edition from the 10th edition, because things change so rapidly right now. You would only give oxygen that's under 94%. So that's something you might want to remember for a test question because the National Registry now is totally on board with this. They may want you to explain it too by test telling them, yeah, you know, for, if I give too much oxygen, free radicals will be released. So typically we like to keep them um, if they have to have oxygen only as much as what's needed to get their SpO2 to 94 or 95%. That's all. So heart failure um, interferes with, again, ejection from the heart. It can be secondary to a heart attack. The valve is now finally messed up, more, more so mitral valves than females, but you never know. Um, hypertension, pulmonary emboli, arrhythmias, and some drugs. So heart failure. So left ventricular failure reduces blood flow and perfusion throughout the body. Backs up, backs up, and then backs up into the left atrium, increasing pressure in the pulmonary veins. Capillaries can start to leak now, which is bad. You're going to start drowning in fluids. So pulmonary edema and impaired gas exchange is a big reality. You can read these. Normal heart normal ventricles, left heart, I mean, left vent ventricle has left ventricular hypertrophy or it's much, much thinner. And that's what you're going to have is uh, reduced cardiac output. So right-sided heart failure can be caused, uh, you know, failure caused by left-sided. Signs include peripheral edema, JVD, enlarged top liver. Hard to hard to feel a liver in a, in a in a person that's related to heart failure. Um, if it's a person with cirrhosis of the liver and it's edematous, yeah, it's very easy to feel and it's a good thing to do. But um, and then some categories you're not you're just not going to feel it. You're not going to feel a large liver. You have to go find find other things to look at. So again, cardiogenic shock can occur with left or right failure. Either side can give you cardiogenic shock. Okay, so here's a nice little graph. I think you have this one in your book table, 17-1. Stolic blood pressure, breast sounds, and peripheral edema. So, um, blood pressure. Clear sound. GVD and peripheral DM at present. Anybody? Let's see. So it's a good little chart to look at. Uh, peripheral DM. Okay. Uh, JVD, jugular venous distension and peripheral edema. No JVD or peripheral edema. Um, if it's acute, and pure left heart failure and acute, yeah, you're going to see that. But So here's, you know, poor grandma. She's in congestive heart failure. She's not feel good. She's tachycardic, cyanosis. 
you know, again, everything you see in here, you should have seen this at least once before. Her blood pressure can be anywhere. Um, may have pink frothy sputum because the pressure in her lungs are so high that um, they get that high and it just leaks across the capillaries. Here's somebody with rather good size uh, pedal edema or pitting edema. Jugular venous dissension. And notice, interesting, notice his ear has a little cyanosis. Yeah, but this is jugular venous distension. So emergency care for heart failure is uh, as treat, treat as you would a myocardial infarction. And get positive pressure ventilation, oxygen, again, based on the guideline, by the guidelines, 94%. And consider the need for CPAP in congestive heart failure. People with heart failure, excuse me, hypertension associated emergencies, well, this is what they're trying to get at right here with the 160 over 94. Um, this is considered, you know, too high of a blood pressure. Uh, and this hypertension, again, if they've never had their blood pressure taken before, you've now discovered they have a history of hypertension, meaning they're good with the signs and symptoms point that direction. Okay, so cardiac arrest, we already know that the heart's not going to pump, no pulse, pale, you know, you know, that they're certainly downhill. Hopefully some of you will get an opportunity to do CPR uh, on a person. And again, cardiac arrest can be caused by acute coronary syndrome um, or a heart attack. Now, nitroglycerin, and you know what? It's probably a good place to take a break. Okay, I have uh, 6.52, so come back at um, uh, 7.04, 7.05, and we'll continue. There's a question. I need to have some money. Yes, it is. It definitely is possible to slow down. Thank you. Yeah, I'll slow down. Okay, so um, yeah, I'll start with nitroglycerin, and I'll kind of recap some of the stuff I as I go along. Um, I'll include it as I go from here on down, especially with your congestive heart failure and your um, left versus right and your myocardial infarction in China. So you are quite welcome. I can do that. Okay, please take a break and be back in. Back, oops, back in 10 minutes from now. Man, my typing is lousy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
I don't know what happened.
Oops. <laughs> okay, let's get going here. Okay, so I'm back. We're back. Hopefully, everyone's back. Um, so, if uh, before I get going, let me just hit a few questions here. So, if somebody, meaning let's say a uh, junior, um, somebody comes up to you and presents their child to you all wrapped up, they say that the one year old has uh, gone through 20 or 30 diapers today and it can't seem to stop having diarrhea, won't take his bottle, it doesn't look real well, he's listless and lethargic. Can that child um, <clears throat> lose uh, plasma and become dehydrated and, and have hypotension? Um, that would one thing I want you to think about. Um, what would happen if you had a clot form in the left anterior descending artery or, you know, left artery, coronary artery? Could that cause cardiac compromise, or de decrease your blood flow by, you know, not having the heart um, function as well, decrease your blood pressure, etc.? cetera? Um, you might want to think about that. Um, which valve is between the right atria and the right ventricle? Um, what's its name? If a patient um, <clears throat> is having chest discomfort, chest pain, more for a male is chest pain, um, if a male is having chest pain and it's not being relieved by his nitroglycerin um, and has not changed the pain at all, um, could this be angina or a um, myocardial infarction? So when you put your stethoscopes on somebody's chest and it's kind of a dull rattling sound, um, is that more consistent with ronchi or crackles? 
or wheezes. If I told you a asthma patient is wheezing, what does that mean to their bronchioles? Are they dilated, uh, normal, or constricted? And we had talked about um, Tuesday about pursed lip breathing. We call it a, call it PEEP, positive in expiratory pressure. So they're doing their own PEEP. Um, we have we can do it with a bag valve mask with a special attachment. But when a person is pursed lip breathing, they're usually tripoding and pursed lip breathing. Um, what is that doing for their uh, alveoli? What and, and you know their airways? What does it do? Is it open them up? Does it collapse them, um, or does it just not change anything? Okay, I'll get to a few more at the end. Um, so nitroglycerin is super important. It's a potent vasodilator. And um, what it does is it can do increase some blood flow to the coronary arteries. Now, if somebody has an actual clot, it's not gonna do anything to a clot, um, but it can increase the blood flow around the area that has the clot. We call it collateral circulation. So what happens is the vessels around that area will plump up and help feed um, that area that's hurting um, with blood, uh, but not all of it. So uh, what really has to take place is that blood flow has to be restored. We have to get rid of that clot. We have a couple ways we do that at the hospital, meaning specialty hospitals. That would be uh, dissolve it with a chemical or to go in there with what they call uh, um, um, percutaneous coronary intervention, go in there and just remove the clot. <clears throat> so EMTs may assist with nitroglycerin and nitro spray. You may assist the patient. However, you need to know this. Their systolic blood pressure has got to be above 90 or no more than 30 millimeters less than the baseline to administer nitroglycerin. So really what they're saying is, is if they have a blood pressure has to remain greater than 90. So if you have it at 130 and you give them nitroglycerin and it drops into 100, you better be very careful about the second one you administer. And you can administer no more than three nitroglycerins, you know, five minutes apart, three to five minutes apart. And again, go by what your book says. And again, if anyone is taking um, any of the erectile dysfunction drugs within 24 hours, or again, longer for some drugs, and I think it's Viagra is 24, Cialis and Levitra are 48, and I don't know stacks and what, that's a relatively new one. It might be even a newer one. I'll have to research it again. Because again, you do not want to give, I think we mentioned, I mentioned this before, you do not want to give this to anyone that um, you're giving nitro to if they're on the stuff. You, you, they're on the stuff, you give them the nitro and their blood pressure is just going to plummet and you're not going to get it back. Um, yeah, then they're done there. So anyway, and that's when it first came out. I mean, it was like totally new to the United States. Even the pharmacists, um, a lot of them, you know, that I talked to, um, about half of them knew about it and half of them didn't. And that was, you know, six pharmacists. So three and three, I'm like, hmm, that's pretty good. It freaked me out. It totally freaked me out when that happened. Um, really shook me. Now... You don't want to administer nitro if they're less than 50 or greater than 100. Um, if you have any, especially greater than 100, you might not, either one, you want, to, you want to ask medical direction if you should do it, but it's really a bad idea under 50. And if they're too much over 100, uh, it's a bad idea. And the reason is both of those situations um, if you take away what you're doing when you give nitro is you're reducing their preload. 
Remember, we talked about this preload, pre heart at your blood pressure. So, if they already have a slow heart rate or one that's way they're too fast, you give them nitroglycerin, you're taking away part of that cardiac output cycle that we had talked about um, and the stroke volume and all that. So, um, you got to be, this is, yeah, you don't want to do it. EMT shouldn't do it. Um, and, and the reason is you can, you can kill them, take away their blood pressure by doing that. So that's really the logic. And again, they just reiterate three doses, um, three to five minutes intervals if pain isn't relieved. But, but that, they got to have that, you know, systolic blood pressure greater than 90. Okay. So a lot of people, you know, people react different to nitro. Some plummet, you know, their blood pressure pretty bad and some not too much. Let me give you an example. If they're nice and hydrated, their probably blood pressure is not going to drop that much. Um, but if it's grandpa with some, you know, 80, 90 year old with some advanced cardiovascular disease um, and he's dehydrated, I have seen him plummet 30 points. So if his blood pressure was, you know, 120 uh, systolic and you have a nitro and now it's 90, um, you, you're pretty well done until a blood pressure comes back up. Um, and it could, it may or may not, because again, dehydration, think about it. Dehydration, his preload's going to be challenged. He's not going to have a, a, a much give or take on the preload. So, and he's not going to be able to have a lot of, uh, because yeah, of his age, not to be able to compensate a whole lot, too. Okay, click on the condition that would make a patient with chest discomfort ineligible to receive nitroglycerin. Okay, that's you guys' question, not mine. Uh, D. D? Oh, beautiful. Very good. Excellent. Very good. Okay, well, let's look how to assist with nitroglycerin. So you did a, do a good, complete assessment of what they're doing. They're getting your SpO2. They're, um, they're making sure it's above 90. Um, they're going to do, you know, get her heart rate, get a complete um, assessment on her, and then they're going to make a decision on whether to give her um, um, nitroglycerin. Now, well, these patients really need to sit or lie down um, when they receive nitroglycerin. For example, if I were her, I'd put, if she'd never, she had not taken it yet or before, she has a brand new prescription, I'd put her on the couch, sit her in the middle, and then, um, you know, carry her to the couch. If she's having chest pain. You don't want, okay, this is a, another thing. It's a pet peeve with me with some things I've seen EMR do lately, and it's probably an ignorance problem. They probably don't have a EMS coordinator, you know, on their butt telling them about this, but you don't have chest pain or stroke patients walk. Once you come in contact with them, if they're having chest pain, that you're, you as a provider, as an EMS professional, thinks they might be having a heart attack, you do not let them walk. You carry them, and it's easy to carry her out of that chair. I've done it before, but if I'm going to give her nitro, I'm going to put her on the couch. The reason is she likes to be in a sitting position. Then you can give her the nitroglycerin. If her blood pressure drops, like down to 90 or a little bit lower, and then you can lay her flat. If you lay her flat, she's going to end up with her blood pressure coming back up a little bit for you. So that's a little trick of the trade. Um, and that's exactly how you should handle that. So problem is, if she's in a chair, you can go to lay her down. You're just going to end up putting her on the floor, on the hard floor, which, eh, I guess you could do that, too. Now, you can obtain an order from medical direction. So some places you have to do that. Um, and some places you don't. You do the offline stuff. Make sure it's her medicine, that it's in date, not expired because we are not allowed to give expired medicine and physicians are not supposed to do that either, but I hear it does happen. If it's the pill you have instead of spray, it goes under the tongue. Now, at home, you've probably never done this, but when you get home, you know, look at the mirror, 
lift up your tongue and look at the vessels underneath it, man, they're very visible. But what happens when you put that under the tongue, that it dissolves, as long as she has a nice moist mouth, it'll dissolve under the tongue. It's going to burn. She should have a headache. Um, and then her chest pain should be relieved is what you're looking for. And then um, her, her vitals may drop a little bit, meaning her blood pressure. Okay. I like the spray. If anyone's dehydrated, spray is going to work. Now, if that first one, let's go back one. Now, if you look at it, it looks kind of dry. I'd have her swallow some, you know, take a little mouthful of water, swish it around, and then swallow it. Or, and then immediately you have her lift up the tongue and put it underneath and close down. Little trick of the trade. Okay, so within two minutes, you want to get a reassessment on that blood pressure. It's a really good thing to do. And then, hey, how are you feeling? And then give it, you know, two more minutes. If she hasn't have a relief of the chest discomfort and her vital signs are still up, give her a second one. Now, pediatrics, we typically don't give nitroglycerin to pediatrics. Um, you know, you, you have to contact base station. Even I would have to contact base station uh, for an order like that as a medic. Uh, so, again, what usually if they're, they have an issue, it's usually because it's a congenital heart condition, not acute, not acute coronary syndrome. Um, kids, well, little people, little ones will have, um, I've up to the age of four and five, I've all of a sudden these kids are having problems like, what the is going on? Well, Somehow, through all this time, they have this congenital heart problem that has been missed, and they've been doing fine until they get to a particular age, and their growth as they're growing is not meeting the demands of the little micro vessels of their heart. Um, so, uh, again, it would be very interesting if you'd ever run across something like that. And again... Cardiac arrest is due to airway compromise or respiratory failure. So, and I know we've gone through, I think I've said that at least three times now. So that's kind of one of those points that you need to take home to the bank because it's going to be on your test uh, somewhere, especially in the national. Or if like what happened to my friend a couple weeks ago, uh, Julio was in one of my EMT classes. He's in medic school now and he got his first baby arrest. Popped right into his head. Oh, heart said, you know, error compromise, respiratory failure, you know. So they approach it from that. Uh, unfortunately, um, the kid did not make it because it really it actually turned out to be a SIDS. So there's nothing you can do about that. So just remember, your highest population is geriatrics. Okay. But... Let me caution you and really listen to this. If you arrive, if you get to somebody's home or one of your friends or family members and you have a teenager there and, or 12 year old, 13, 14, 15, and they're having you a, a problem, it sounds like acute coronary syndrome. If they're having the same signs and symptoms as an adult, meaning, uh, let me see, it was a 13 year old Matt Johnson I had. Uh, Dr. Schaffner was there. Um, he was 13. He came in by ambulance. They didn't even start IV on him. Uh, they put him on some oxygen, which, they, you know, then they didn't. Uh, they probably didn't think they checked his SpO2. So, you know, they're just thinking, oh, it's some kind of pleuritic thing or maybe hurt himself or whatever. So Matt and I looked at each other and go, let's do a pediatric, you know, EKG on him. So, we switched the machine into pediatric mode, did an EKG, and we both looked at it and went, huh? Because we both read 12 lead EKGs. So we took it to Dr. Schaffner, and he goes, yeah, that can happen. So we went in and did a full assessment. Sure enough, the kid was having a mild cardiac infarction. 13 years old. And no, he wasn't drinking 10 Monsters or 5 Monsters or anything like that. And what Dr. Schaffner, he followed up, is just he had a congenital, congenital small um, vessels of the heart when he got to that age, it just could not meet the demands, and they were really small and one clotted. That's the way it goes. So anyway, kind of a gross analogy, but if it, 
if you step in it and it's on your boot and you look at it and it looks like it and it smells like it, it's probably what you step, what you think and you just stepped in and the dog's smiling at you. Okay. So I don't want you to tunnel vision. I want you to be practitioners that look at a situation, no matter what the age is, you do your assessment as good medical practitioners, just like physicians were, you know, 50, 60 years ago. They didn't have all these toys to figure something out like these young docs do. And I'm going to be giving the speech uh, in, in June to some uh, new resident physicians. Um, and same thing. Um, they're, they're no different than you guys and gals. You know, I'll be telling the same thing, not to tunnel vision, okay, and not to blow things off. That's the worst thing you do. Listen to your patients. Listen to what they're telling you. They're telling you things that sound are signs and they're sim or symptoms of something that points towards an acute coronary syndrome. You guys and gals are going to make a difference in somebody's life by listening to them and following that direction. Yeah, it's kind of a pet peeve on physicians that tunnel vision and medical professionals. Okay, so now all they're saying here is all these different types of things on the left, diabetes, mellitus, history of trauma, can be, uh, you know, can have uh, cardiac implications, history of asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. You can always have a myocardial infarction, which means you've got a history of coronary artery disease, you have this MI, but they can also have what's called comorbidities. Let me back up a second. Diabetes is comorbidity. Having history of falling and traumatizing yourself is a comorbidity. History of asthma, history of COPD is a comorbidity. Um, history of gross obesity, that's a comorbidity. In any of these problems where somebody's having a heart attack, now you have all these other what we call comorbidities or medical problems that exacerbate, or another word for that, or way is to make worse, will make the situation worse, okay? Okay, use your assessment-based approach. I don't care how old they are, if they're complaining of chest pain. Um, so you got cardiac compromise, do they have it? Do they, are they pointing towards acute coronary syndrome? What is dispatch saying? If they hopefully they're doing EMD, emergency medical dispatch, their assessment's going to be a little bit more accurate than somebody that uh, dispatch that's not. However, it's up to you when you walk in and do your door, um, walk in the door triage and do your general scene size up and start assessing the patient. You're the one that's going to have the best information and most accurate information after getting that good size up. So you give your primary assessment and you categorize the patient, are they unresponsive, cardiac arrest, um, you know, what's, are there, where are they at, minor, minor, severe, and so what's going on. So again, if they're cardiac arrest, you already know how to run that. I'm not gonna walk through that with you. And if they're not, then you can obtain their QOP Keras T from them, it's just chest pain. and. We like to have you, if you can, a lot of us are carrying check sheets to uh, see if there's any contraindication to fibrolytic therapy or to angioplasty. There's more contraindications to using fibrolytic therapy than there is to doing angioplasty. And angioplasty means they just go in through the femoral artery, which is the old way, go up to your heart, and you get to that clot, and they fix it. They remove it and put a stent in keeps the vessel open, okay, pushes all that plaque out of the way, okay, and then there are certain types of patients that downplay their symptoms, and it's usually, well, let's say it's usually, some men and a lot of women downplay what they have or what's going on, um, you know, the worst are medical people, um, or absolutely the worst, um, I can't be having a heart attack, I'm too young, you know, I'm a nurse, I'm a paramedic, I'm a doctor, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know what? Sorry, you're a humanoid life form. You have the same anatomy and physiology as of all of us, all of you guys and gals and me together. We all have the same physiology. And guess what? It can happen to you. So denial is one of the worst things that these people have that can get them in the biggest trouble. 
time is tissue. When you talk about a heart attack, like a brain attack, and we'll talk about strokes in another chapter, heart attack, time is tissue. Okay? So when you're um, somebody that has a chest pain or something that's cardiac compromised, greater than 20 minutes, it's probably not going to be angina. Um, so... Again, you're going to be looking more at probably myocardial infarction. Um, was it progressive? Was it sudden onset? Now, there are people that also get nocturnal angina. And what that means is it wakes them out of a sleep. And they'll have um, angina attack. So cardiac compromise, and I, why I highlighted this, you're going to see it often abbreviated as ACS, acute coronary syndrome, or... Um, which is one of the things, or cardiac compromise, really means the same thing, okay? So angina, not relieved by nitro, three nitro over 10 minutes, uh, you probably got a MI there. Chest pain discomfort lasting five minutes to 10 minutes after rest. So usually these people that have angina, they one, rest, two, take their nitroglycerin with the rest. So the rest, three nitro, Greater than 10 minutes really strongly still points towards um, myocardial infarction. Um, now you have the atypical presentations. All my medics at, at Hemet and at Murrieta know how to pick those out. It's a big deal with me because um, my mom had a heart attack and she had the atypical presentation. So it's been on my soapbox that when you have women um, that you do extra special, um, good assessment, trying to pick out if they have an atypical presentation, okay? Um, so their physical exam, you know, oral cavity. Now, if somebody has pain in the chest, it radiates in the neck or mouth, or they, I've actually had people with weird pains in the jaw radiating down to, the, down to their shoulders. A uh, 56-year-old male comes in, I have a bad tooth, I have a lot of really bad jaw pain. Oh, how long ago it started? Started about 30 minutes ago. And, oh, okay, and what happened? What, is there anything happened unusual for you? He goes, yeah, I got really weak and I broke out in a sweat when it started. I'm still kind of sweaty. But I touched him, sure enough, he was clammy, a little cool. And I go, hmm, this is kind of weird for a tooth problem. So I look at his tooth, look beautiful to me, no redness, uh, no cavity. So I go, okay, 12 lead time. Sure enough, he was having a heart attack. So again, I you could have picked that out, not just me, but you, men, young ladies and men, can pick this stuff out if you're inquisitive. Try to pretend you're like one of the detectives, like, I don't know, on one of these detective shows, and, and be able to examine and ask questions. Um, and have a whole line of questions. There, there's plenty of stuff in your book where they give you, okay, if you have abdominal pain, these are all the questions you ask and what you assess. When you have chest pain, when you have um, um, all these different things, um, hypoglycemia, et cetera. So these are some of the typical um, things that um, people with acute coronary syndrome or a heart attack have. Now, Again, this model right here, I have seen for probably the last 35 years, maybe longer. This is based on males, not females. Now, if there are a couple that are similar for females, and one of them is epigastric or upper abdomen, um, in, and it's described as uh, indigestion. The other is... Um, um, in like just one arm or around the neck. Okay, all the rest are really male. So around the neck, now I don't have one arm. So anyway, so one arm or epigastric. Okay, and then with those weird discomforts. Now, I don't like to call it chest pain. I try to wipe that out of my assessment mouth. Um, and if I keep doing it, if I say pain, um, I'm going to start eating ghost peppers or something. So every time I do that. So the reason is I use discomfort. Sir, ma'am, do you have any type of chest discomfort? 
discomfort of the jaw or neck or back or are in your arms that kind of just started any kind of discomfort or in this area. So, and the reason is, is a lot of people um, won't describe it as pain. So if you just say pain, they'll go, oh, no, I don't have pain. If you say, just, you have a discomfort, they go, well, yeah, now you mentioned you have a discomfort. So if you use that approach and that terminology, I'm telling you, you're going to be way ahead of everybody for a long time because people use pain all the time. And I'm telling you, a lot of people don't perceive the pain. And especially on the elderly, um, if they're taking other medicines, they may not perceive the pain because of what they're taking will change it from a pain to a dull, uh, funny sensation or a strange sensation. Um, and, you know, some of these old people or older people have been on, well, for years, uh, uh, large dose anti-inflammatories, uh, naproxen, um, ibuprofen or for their arthritis and these this pain complaint neck complaint they may be on narcos or um, um, uh, what the heck are those called anti-anxiety agents and um, anyway so they may be on some of that kind of stuff that's going to dull the sensation of what's pain and they're going to end up with a, a comfort good exam of the chest um, I would push on it, ask them if they fall, hit their chest, anything like that. And then if they said yes, and you're going to do the hoop test or just look at the areas in which they fell. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when you're doing, again, a good assess, assessment, your vital signs, you already know that. You know, where is the discomfort? Now they put, they cheat, put discomfort or pain. Um, anyone says discomfort, they're going to see it. Oh, okay, this is a weird discomfort. If anyone, you hear the word discomfort and actually having pain, they're going to go, yeah, yeah, that's a discomfort. Pain's a discomfort. So that makes sense, I hope. Um, again, so again, it may radiate. The big one here, and I wish I had highlighted it, didn't have enough to do a lot of the highlighting, is sudden onset of sweating. And with that one, especially in women, they'll get an onset of sweating and get really super weak. Like all of a sudden, like they just like they can hardly stand up. They just get real weak. That's a bad. That's a bad sign in a, in a young lady. They need to have that investigated. Um, go in and get an EKG or something because that is not normal. Okay. Um, it, maybe they, with that, they might have an onset of a little bit of pain in their jaw and their neck or a little epigastric, and it's really described as indigestion. You know, oh yeah, I took some Maalox. I hear this. Okay. Oh yeah, I took some tums. Did it relieve it? Oh, a little bit. Uh, okay. So break out in the sweat, became very weak. This weird, you know, indigestion. Only, you know, the stuff they normally take that only took it away a little bit. And I hear that a lot. I cannot tell you. Um, I did triage for like four years, uh, and I just like, oh my goodness. And we all rotated through, but. Um, some will get irritable, irritable and anxiety for no reason. Fear the ones that say or have a feeling of impending doom. Um, out of, I can't even count how many people I've, I have, um, you know, told me they had the fear of or impending doom feeling. They usually go into cardiac arrest. And I can't think of any of them that have gotten back. And there's only one that had a fear of impending doom or the feeling of impending doom that um, did not go into cardiac arrest, got her treated, but she had what we call tombstones. And um, yeah, um, not good. Okay, so abnormal pulse, be irregular. Um, and if you had an EKG machine looked at, they could be what's called PVCs, premature ventricular contractions. So just notice if anyone with chest discomfort and signs of acute coronary syndrome, have irregular pulse, you probably should be really on your guard. Nausea and vomiting also, that's associated with the lower part of the heart, heart attacks, meaning the inferior wall. Okay, so um, again, a lot of positional comfort, reassort, associate, you know, um, you know, just reconfirm, you know, we're going to get you to the hospital. We're going to get medics units coming or hospitals down the road. We're going to get you there. 
Now, FIOXA, according to the 2010 guideline, that has to do with the 94%. They do not want you, unless they're 94%, they don't want you giving, you know, oxygen to somebody that has acute coronary syndrome. So if they're at 94, 95%, life is good. If they're under that, give them, you know, two liters of, of, uh, of oxygen by nasal cannula. Okay. So assist them with their prescriptions. Hopefully, um, if they are not allergic to aspirin, hopefully they will take some aspirin um, and, or your system uh, advocates giving them aspirin. Um, and, you know, it's important that they take aspirin. Now, you can consult medical direction um, if you're an online protocol. But if somebody tells you, oh, you know, my doctor says I can't take aspirin because I'm on Coumadin. And the guy has... He's pale, cool, clammy, sudden, and, um, sudden onset of some sort of chest pain right up to his neck or back. Um, and all, everything that says this guy is like acute coronary syndrome or having a heart attack, he needs the aspirin. And the reason I'm saying that is people that are on blood thinners, if they're truly on a blood thinner, thinner that means they're not going to form clots. That's why they're on the blood thinners to prevent that. And if they're forming a clot, and it's becoming acute coronary syndrome, that means their blood thinner is not working. So I'm hoping everyone is with me on this. Um, that's an, an important concept. I train only medics that way too, and any of the nurses that come in, um, if we don't have a doctor right away, who's seeing the other you know, 20 patients in the ER, we have to make a decision. We have it written into our protocols that to go ahead and administer the, nitro, the um, aspirin for them in that circumstance. So just remember, one thing you keep in your mind, any acute coronary syndrome patient, you know, cardiac compromised patient, is a time bomb. And how they're going to go off is they're going to go into cardiac arrest in front of your face. They'll be talking to you one minute saying, oh, my pain's pretty bad, and blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, their eyes are going to roll back, they start a seizure, and they go into what's called ventricular fibrillation. And uh, then you have to get your... AED out, slap it on their chest, and get them shocked, and hopefully you can get them back. Okay. So let's look at what we got here now. So Lisa prepares a stretcher. Now hopefully they're not walking the patient. Um, she's taking additional nitroglycerin according to protocol. They gave her 325 aspirin. Yay, good job, guys and gals, uh, team. Um, they reassess Mr. Fry's paint level and vital signs. And look at the blood pressure is 128 now. Stall it. Good. Discomfort's down at 4 out of 10. Um, candidate for another dose of nitroglycerin. So we could get another one. Um, if it hasn't changed at that next one, hasn't changed it or the last one. Again, he's probably sounding more like a cardiac patient that has an MI. Well, oh, he is having an acute MI. Mr. Fry is having AMI, acute myocardial infarction. So they're going to do fibrolytic medication on him. I've done it um, quite a few times. Our hospital is probably one of the fastest. Now the standard, that is not the standard anymore. The standard now is um, what they call angioplasty. Um, it's um, less side effects and, and potential problems than giving fibrinolytic therapy. So just remember, um, car coronary disease is a significant problem. We're seeing more of it in younger people. So you guys and gals in your practice, whether you, I'm hoping you go from EMT, get a lot of good experience to become a paramedic, or we really could use PAs, or for the ones that are going into nursing, um, you know, get your nursing under your for a couple of years and consider a nurse practitioner. Really could use those. And then again, be thorough in your assessments, kind and gentle, loving to people in their worst time because a lot of people with cardiac and they have an MI, they, they've got that kind of thing in the back of their mind, you know, from TV that they're going to die. Um, they may or may not have that feeling of a pending doom, but they're going to be have a lot of anxiety, but you need to try and calm down too because people with a lot of anxiety in this situation, the chemicals that are dumped in their system, the um, Cortisol, the um, epinephrine and norepinephrine 
right now um, makes your heart much more irritable and that you know you really need to get them somewhere that uh, treats acute coronary syndrome uh, meaning a heart center which we have a lot of them in the area you're going to be working in in southern california they're just about everywhere and that's the type of hospital they need to go so just remember pain of survival and for those that have acute coronary syndrome oxygen if they're under 94 percent nitro and aspirin are the drugs that emt may use to treat acs Remember, okay, let's see where we're at, wow. Okay, that was quick. Whoops, sorry about that. Oops. Everyone's still there? Where'd I go? I'm here. Okay. Okay. Um, open up. Okay. Uh, there, let me see if I can find what I was looking for. Let me see, this is a uh, ventricular fibrillation. Okay, so So, yeah, I was, I was, somebody had asked me about, um, if you only had like three or four different things that, it, you know, pre-hospital care person were allowed to have and use, um, like in a rural area or somewhere, um, my, my thoughts would be, um, <clears throat> as far as medicine would be, um, epinephrine, uh, one to one thousandths, um, albuterol, uh, would be another one those two things um nitroglycerin and aspirin um, and any types of equipment would be um, an aed and a good valve, bag valve mass system uh, with oxygen um, so if those were the only thing you're allowed to carry that would actually take in a lot of different types of problems um if there were diabetic need sugar you usually have access to you know, honey or syrup or some weird thing like that. But I was just, you know, they put me in this funny position to, you know, try and critically think through some of the different things we would need or you could have. But really, an EMT armed with, you know, bag valve mask, a defibrillator, epinephrine, one to one thousands. Um, your brain is your best tool that you have. It's an amazing tool um, that you have. Uh, okay, so let me go through just a few more questions and I'll let you uh, go and then sp and spend time, um, you know, prepping um, and studying. 
so what is make sure you understand what why why we give um, albuterol which is called prevental um, you know albuterol is a generic prevental is a trade name and what it really does um, the med, that medication when we give that kind of medication it's a it's a bronchodilator relaxes the airways and opens up the airways so they can breathe so that's really what why we like to use albuterol and you should know the difference between angina and a myocardial infarction so if you don't quite clear yet so angina is um, where the the vessels are really small there's no clot but the vessel lumen the inside is real small like those you know, pictures of those four vessels I showed you, you know, from the way open one to the one with a little clot in it. So angina is the, the, the narrowed one. So if you were to get up and have angina and you haven't mowed your lawn for 30 years, you always have somebody do it. Now you say, well, I'm going to get out and mow my lawn. So you go out and start mowing and, you know, it's a lot of hard work and the grass is like three feet high. And now all of a sudden you're doing all this work, you're not used to it. Now you got to have an angina attack. Okay. But the difference is, again, is a myocardial infarction is a clot. It's a it's a plug. So the rupture happens, the clot forms like a clot you would if you had a cut on the outside of your skin, forms inside the center of that vessel, and anything from there down does not get any blood flow, or very little, if any. And then you have your tissue starting to die. So with that being said. If that were to happen on a big chunk of the left ventricle, you might want to say to yourself or think about it, you know, how is that going to affect that patient um, as far as um, their physiology? You know, a big, large myocardial infarction on the left side of the heart. But let me see if this will cover it. I don't know. I may have to look at one for heart failure. But real quickly. See if this covers a good round oh, can't play. Close. Um, see if I can open it with BLC. A heart attack, also known as a myo. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, somebody's way out where, like that lady was dropping out there, um, especially who goes into cardiac arrest. Um, yeah, she's not going to do very well. And remember, I use the term time is tissue, and there's a reason I, I said that is because, you know, there's a question that kind of talks about that. Yeah, time is tissue. So, yeah, people on average, you know, three hours, time is tissue. So, I've actually had a lady that rated, it was probably about 14 hours uh, to come in and um, 
man, she did not look good. Well, what happened is she her heart attack was big enough that um, it started to affect her cardiac, you know, cardiac pumping. And so she had cardiac compromise. And she became what's known now as a cardiac cripple, meaning that if she had had that address within, you know, less four hours or less, um, she would probably have a whole lot of extra tissue um, and not be a cardiac cripple, meaning she'll have to be on lenoxin or digoxin the rest of her life to strengthen what tissue she has left to give her enough blood flow through her body to meet her needs. So, yeah, anybody that, you know, puts that stuff off is asking for trouble. Um, <clears throat> you know, critically think through the use of oxygen. Um, as far as, you know, when to give it and how much to give. Um, know what septic shock is and what causes it. Um, again, if you have somebody that's mowing the grass, they start having chest discomfort, they go sit down and it goes away. What is that a myocardial infarction or is that angina? Yeah, so questions are going to revolve around that. And I talked about a 26 year, you know, young between the ages of um, 20 and 27, 28, people having sudden onset of pneumothorax uh, and how you would assess that. What would be the really key factor in assessing? Um, to me, they would, you know, they're going to have some shortness of breath. They're going to give you that history, but... I think I'm going to use my stethoscope. So you can put your stethoscope on and see if, or hear if one side is different than the other. The side he has pain on or he felt a pop um, and hurts the most, you, you listen to that side, it's diminished versus the other side. That's where your pneumothorax is. So voila, he found a spontaneous pneumothorax. And the guy would be in the age group if he was in between 20 and like 27 ish, 28. Um, okay, once you get to the hospital, uh, you don't give any more medicines or treatment stuff. That patient belongs to the hospital. What your job is then is to put them on a stretcher. Um, and that's a, one of those national registry things too, uh, because once you step in a hospital, you're, that patient belongs to the hospital, not you, and not the EMS system, okay? So you don't go in there and start giving a bunch of medicines and doing this and that. that. That patient belongs to them now. That becomes a patient-physician relationship, which is like one of those platinum or gold things that no one messes with. What's the limit for a nitroglycerin? When should you not give nitroglycerin? What would raise your suspicion if somebody may have a pulmonary emboli? Remember I talked to you about people that have recent, had recent surgeries, especially below the waist. Um, uh, those types of people may have, um, uh, potentially have some kind of a, um, this thing is killing me here. There we go. Okay. Question, Art. Yes. How often do blood clots and pulmonary embolisms play into the cardiac arrest stuff, like with the heart association? Uh, they're not as they're not as much or as many of them as those who walk around with undiagnosed acute uh, undiagnosed um, coronary artery disease. It's usually what's interesting is the first time somebody knows they're having a, they have a heart attack or some kind of cardiac problems when they have chest pain. And that's the majority of them. Um, and then a majority, and a lot of those, the first time they know that, you know, they got a problem is they drop over in cardiac arrest. Um, just recently, a couple people I've known, um, it's really totally surprised me, just keeled over in cardiac arrest. Um, and I, you would never suspect it. One of them was like total workout guru. And um, he was uh, in his fifties. So, but pulmonary emboli 
the, the categories are um, somebody that has had a recent surgery, usually from the waist down, and uh, they tend to be sedentary. And um, nobody thought to put them on a, a anticoagulant for a while. The next, next category are those with like varicose veins and elderly that spend a lot of time sitting and watching things like Oprah. Um, you can get brain damage that way and uh, end up with a clot. Uh, and then the smaller categories are those that are in good shape that are workout gurus and stuff like that who push themselves and get dehydrated. And they may or may not have some uh, varicose veins with that dehydration um, is a big factor in clot formation in the lower extremity. So even somebody in, that runs marathons like the Boston Marathon and LA Marathon, um, they can get off the plane, go home, and then all of a sudden now they have a, an MI. And, you know, I, I just vividly see the guy that was at Staples in Marietta step off the curb, 40 something years old, like a super shape, you know, built like a cheetah. And he just got back from the Boston Marathon. And voila, he's got a myocardial infarction. So, um, yeah, those are there tend to be a little more rare, definitely, than those that just have either undisclosed, undisclosed cardiovascular disease. And that's the majority of them that have MIs that, oh, I'm in good shape. Well, I didn't think about it. You know, it's like, OK, um, I ended up getting a cardiac workout because I fell and hit my chest. And they also, oh, chest pain. Oh, like they decided they take an opportunity and finagle a, a complete cardiac workout on me and came in through flying colors, did the treadmill until, you know, the cows came home and they were like, oh, man, not too bad for an old, old guy. But yeah, um, yeah, come throw 80 pound bales of hay with me. Do about 40 of them, see how you feel. Anyway, um, but yeah, that's a good question. Very good question. Um, I think in my career, I've only had um, 13 or 14. The rest of them, by a lot, were all because they had cardiovascular disease. And the worst part about it is people, the first time they know they have a heart attack is when they go into cardiac arrest. And that's the sad, that's really sad. Uh, and it still happens to today. And yeah, um, um, there was one young lady, just a sweetheart. She was our dispatcher at Marietta when I was over there. And she uh, hurt the, the, she was 36. Um, they had varicose veins. And, um, you know, we didn't find out that until later. But sedentary because they do 12 hour shifts over there, weren't getting up and moving around like they're supposed to, they do now. And all of a sudden, she started having severe, you know, shortness of breath and became cyanotic. She went in full of rest around the hospital and they never got her back. Um, that was just like a total sad day. But um, again, the sedentary thing. Um, so like me sitting here, I flex my, you don't see it. Or when I fly on a plane, I flex my feet back and forth. I'm always moving my legs. And the reason is the movement of your legs promotes blood flow. That's when you don't do that and you're you're you stay set in the same spot for a long period of time that you can potentially sludge and form a clot. So, awesome, awesome question. Very good question. Does anybody have any more questions? Or if you need anything, you may text me or I'll go on to my AOL.com site and if anyone sends me an email. I gotta check my emails anyway. And they send me in. Um, but I think that's your test. And when is that one? Do? The next one. Um, oh, test four. So is that the end of this weekend? Yeah, this is. Okay. So I'll have it ready at 10 o'clock Monday, 8 o'clock Monday, Friday morning, this Friday. 8 o'clock until Sunday night at 10. So I'll give you guys gals some time. And then, yes, the 19th is your midterm. The 19th is the midterm. Correct. And they're going to go through a study guide and all this kind of stuff with you. Um, 
but this weekend you still get test four. It's only 40 questions. And you've just heard them if you're listening to the 40 questions um, or, you know, they're off. And let's see, are there any other comments? No. Okay. Well, if nobody has any questions, please have a good night. Utilize the next two hours wisely. Okay. And study, study, and everyone get an A on the test, please. Um, you know, put your thinking caps on. I know you guys and gals can do it. And I will talk to you later. Okay. Good night. Okay, Perry was here. Uh, okay. Chris Bo was here. Uh, what's the other was where's Gino? Gino, is he here? Okay, there's a question. Uh, well, good night.